Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Todd Burnett, who's VP of Managed Services at Robinson Fresh, which is a division of CH Robinson. And today we're going to talk about macro growth in micro supply chains. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's what e-commerce is doing to the retail uh, grocery industry and perishable supply chains. Um, you know, it's dry, driving rapid change, uh, you know, across the industry, which on the one hand is creating challenges for all stakeholders, but on the other hand is creating a lot of opportunities for differentiation and to capture market share. So what are these, uh, some of these challenges and opportunities? Uh, what actions do grocery retailers and their perishable supply chain partners take uh, to, uh, uh, you know, succeed in this new environment? And what ultimately will separate the leaders from the laggards in this industry? Well, that's going to be the, the key focus of today's conversation, and it's great to welcome back uh, Todd to the program, yeah. Yeah, uh, you. You know, based on his uh, insights and perspective on this market, to kind of share his view on this. So, Todd, welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you having me back. As you know, I have a face for uh, radio, not for video, so I appreciate you putting me back on. But um, just to, to give a little background, so I'm the VP of Services at Robinson Fresh, which is a division of C.H. Robinson. I oversee our managed procurement services, which is a full outsource platform for retailers and food service folks. Um, also, their replenishment services, their service center network. Um, I've been with them for going on 27 years now. Most of that time on the fresh uh, fruit side of the business, uh, the perishable side of the business. Um, I do have background with them on the transportation side and, and logistics. So, um, pretty excited about talking to you uh, today, and a lot of the, a lot of the changes that uh, e-commerce is actually driving in these uh, supply chains. We call it the macro growth of micro supply chains. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it's great to have you back. I know the last time you were on the program, we, we were talking about some of the challenges in, in the perishable supply chains, and and you know, you know, it's it's an area that I think you know a lot of us go into the grocery store and you know kind of see fruits and vegetables and and all, the, all these types of items. And you know, when you really think about all the complexity and everything that goes into uh, you know, getting that product there on time with great quality and so forth, you, know, you, you really appreciate you know, uh, you know, all the hard work that goes, goes into that. Um, so, so let's talk now, I mean, you, you mentioned it, I mentioned it in my opening remarks, you, you just mentioned it now. You know, our, e-commerce is arguably the, the biggest transformational force you know, affecting all industry and, and grocery retail and, and perishable supply chains are really no, no exception. And, you know, since you have, you know, you, you gave your background I and mean, you have, you know, broad perspective working with perishable companies on, on the Robinson Fresh side, and then you also are very involved on the logistics and, and transportation side with, on the C.H. Robinson side. I mean, can you comment uh, a little bit about the, the, the impact that e-commerce is having on, on perishable supply chains and, and grocery retail? Yeah, yeah. So on average, uh, year over year on the, on the retail grocery segment of e-commerce, it's growing at about 35% per year, massive growth there. Um, the prediction is over the next two to five years, really all uh, retail grocery, essentially about 70% they're predicting will be purchased online uh, through either an app-based environment or an online type-based environment. So uh, what this means for uh, retail grocery, essentially 70% of the time the consumer is going to have a, a great experience. Uh, middle of the road experience or quite possibly uh, not a really good experience. So um, with all of these changes going on, realistically, market forecasts are that grocery and supply chains, uh, they're outpacing the industry's need uh, to accommodate, really to accommodate all these changes. So drastic changes in this growing demand, especially in fresh and perishable. So um, like I talk to our customers about this, this market imbalance really isn't a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. It means that market share is up for grabs, all market share is up for grabs. And that's no more evident than imperishable because um, realistically that's what, the, uh, that's what really grabs uh, the experience for the grocery uh, shopper. So all of, all of these things going on in retail and grocery perishable, um, there's a bunch of micro supply chains going on at this macro level. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you, you can't go uh, kind of a week without picking up the newspaper and seeing, you know, some of the big names in grocery retail and, and kind of the, the changes going on there in terms of, uh, like you said, e-commerce and all these different, you know, models because they, they understand whether it's, 
you know, delivery of groceries to the home or whether it's, you know, buy online and then have it ready for you to pick up. And, and that's having kind of this ripple effect on, uh, you know, not only store operations, but everything behind it in terms of making sure that product is there, you know, at, at the, uh, at the supermarket, at the grocery oh, store yeah. in the right time at the right, in the right quality and, and, and so forth. So, so I want to explore a little bit about like kind of the title of the episode and what you just mentioned right now, you, you know, macro growth of micro supply chains. Can, can you explain that a little bit? What does that mean exactly? Yeah. So I'll kind of break it down into two sections. I'll, I'll comment first on, uh, micro and macro and then kind of get in a little bit later on and what what that actually means what does that mean so um in today's retail environment the produce and perishable uh, uh, managers and uh, those folks uh, doing the procurement of that they're used to um, what goes on from an ad perspective when to run watermelons when to run strawberry ads when to be in and out of product they're they're really a well-oiled machine and if you think about what's going on uh, with change and consumers' habits are changing, so we're talking about millennials, Gen Zs, those types of things, uh, customers really are coming in, they're wanting uh, more pre-prepared type items uh, that would be in meal kits, uh, that's processed type items, uh, that's grab and go. What's really, um, those inventories and supplies run uh, totally different. So. Um, it's really kind of this app-based online uh, food service experience at retail. So, and then uh, you add this different component with all of these different suppliers, uh, new packaging, new processing that go, goes on. Uh, it's totally different experience than the traditional brick and mortar uh, style. So uh, really you want, the goal is to have the consumer to have a great uh, experience now, when they have that, because when they do, um, you get repeat customers. And with that, perishable, fresh, processed, prepackaged, meal kit type of things, it's instant or near instant inventory. And that, that inventory has to meet that available demand. The, um, those inventory flows are different. Those patterns are different. And really, uh, we consider this for retailers a, a macro challenge. Um, and then secondly, um, to describe really what this means, I'll kind of break it down into um, the traditional infrastructure in, in today's, uh, in today's uh, typical brick and mortar uh, environment, which is, uh, has large uh, capital warehousing inf infrastructure, large capital dedicated to uh, inventory, and really right now, convenience and time, uh, those are the driving forces behind e-commerce. So, and then when I mentioned geography earlier, I, I do talk about placement and that's forward placement of inventory because fresh and perishable has to have um, high turns, uh, short shelf life, high demand. And so really what I mean by macro is that your warehousing uh, and inventory flows, that's really the first step to meet this uh, convenience. So additionally, um, in the past, a commissary may, may have been thought of a little bit different. In today's retail environment, um, the store itself can be treated as a commissary in this perishable environment. So um, the thing about current warehousing, so uh, DCs typically don't have the infrastructure to support these quick turns, nor do they do they have the um, the space uh, to add on to these SKUs. And then you you piece into their orders are coming in maybe ten hours in advance, twelve hours in advance, and, and they have to they have to meet those POs. On top of that, the shelf life uh, may only be forty eight uh, hours or longer, three to five days. So. These goods are moving in, in a much, much faster pattern than uh, traditional retail. Um, inventory has to be held uh, short shelf life. Inventory has to be held closer. And uh, really, you're going to create these micro supply chains uh, around these store groupings. So um, third party uh, supply chain partners uh, like us uh, at CH Robinson and Robinson Fresh um, will more than likely need to need to be engaged to have this flexible warehousing and uh, inventory model. So 
just kind of wrap it all up in terms of what it is and what it means. It's this macro growth of these micro supply chains around these geographies. And what it actually means is you're gonna need more closer uh, anytime, anywhere to meet the consumer demands. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think what's interesting is, I mean, you see, uh, you know, a lot of the headlines, you know, in, in recent weeks have been about, you know, the moves that certain big players out there are making to make, you know, uh, next day, you know, free next day delivery and, and kind of the ripple effect that that's having on, you know, supply chain yeah. and, and distribution networks and so forth. But I think when you think about it from a perishable standpoint, right, it's one thing to create this network where you're going to be delivering, you know, books or you're delivering electronic gadgets or clothes or something, you know, next day. Uh, but when your clock is really truly ticking on these perishable items, um, and it's something that, um, you know, I think people have very different expectations to grocery items and perishable items than they do to, you know, getting a, a, a more physical, you know, product that, uh, you know, doesn't have the same characteristics. Uh, you know, you realize that when you try to create these, these micro supply chains, uh, just because of the, the perishable nature of what you're dealing with, um, you know, the level of, <laughs> there's this much more smaller tolerance for, uh, you know, things to go wrong because you, you can just have complete yeah. spoilage of, uh, you know, very expensive uh, product out there yeah. if you don't get this right, right? And there's uh, nothing worse than having a bad customer experience. Uh, it can be easily done with these types of products. <clears throat> so that would be number one. And or uh, when the consumer orders this online or through their app, and from an inventory perspective, it's not there. When they either go in to pick it up or when it gets delivered to their uh, car. So um, that's the real challenge is to have a really good uh, customer experience when they do get the product but then more likely to manage inventory uh, upstream. So um, a lot of these, it's not, obviously it's not static inventory, so you're not keeping books in a big warehouse somewhere. Right, right. Press turn type stuff. So um, some examples of this would be uh, in the real world, um, some traditional warehousing networks for uh, retail grocers, let's say on a national scope, may have uh, three or four warehouses spread up in a, in a large geographic pattern. Let's say, you know, two out in California, one in the Midwest, maybe up in Chicago, and then one, one East Coast in, in Pennsylvania. Um, for the most part, e-commerce and, and um, these types of companies that are shrinking uh, the distance between uh, inventory warehousing and consumer, they'll have a much broader scope of their warehousing network, say, uh, eight different states and a concentration of maybe four to six warehouses within those states uh, because convenience and inventory turn, that's at the heart of what of what those e-com retailers do. And that has to get filtered into uh, the retail, the grocery retail side. So um, here at Robinson, we do, we do have a large uh, array of third-party warehouses and networks on both the ambient and the perishable side. Uh, but one thing to think about uh, when these inventory and warehousing patterns change, it's that product inventories, they're being spread out in, in different origin and destination pairs. So uh, from the logistics side, traditionally, when I talked about that, that initial warehousing network, um, you could manage freight from California into, say, Illinois or Pennsylvania. Um, well, with these um, non-static warehouses and perishable warehouses and these uh, closer, den more dense geographies, uh, the whole logistical patterns, just, it's just going to change. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that always, uh, uh, you know, I think it, it, um, more and more companies are starting to recognize is, you know, there's a lot of discussion over the past couple of years about digital transformation. And a lot of that, conf a lot of that discussion has been more on the IT side in terms of, you know, the companies need to, to modernize and, and upgrade their IT capabilities in order to keep up with all these things that we're talking about, e-commerce and changing consumer uh, expectations and so forth. But the reality is, and I wrote about this on Talking Logistics uh, you know, last year, is that all of this is also having a physical transformation, right? So you're, you're having to transform the, the distribution and transportation networks as well in order to meet these uh, you know, changing requirements. So from, from a logistics and transportation perspective, I mean, you just talked about, you know, kind of the changes that need to take place from, a, you know, kind of a network, a DC standpoint. I mean, what, what impact will these changes have 
uh, in distribution networks, so what impact will it have on transportation strategies? I mean, what, what will be new and different moving forward? Yeah, so um, first uh, to mention on the digital transformation, we, we're a leader in the industry on that, and we're gonna stay a leader in the industry on that. Um, and through that transformation, when you think about logistics and these patterns, so more warehousing and different inventory patterns means uh, logistics, it's gonna be messy. And what you need to think about is uh, more LTL options and who you're partnering up with uh, from an LTL standpoint. And then incorporating consolidation and deconsolidation uh, in, into um, your supply chain network. So freight will transition from long haul, multi-day uh, type of hauls to short haul with much less lead times. Um, that means your transportation strategy and logistics strategy is gonna have to change. In today's environment, although um, we may have felt the, mar the market has maybe uh, tempered a little bit, uh, capacity is still a premium in this marketplace. And um, markets where there are large shifts and, uh, and the way freight is moving means you're gonna have to establish a bunch of new relationships. Um, and especially on the capacity side of the business, because in the reality, Adrian, it's it's a bunch of small carriers and medium-sized carriers that make up the overall uh, capacity out there domestically. Um, and retailers, when this changes, they're gonna have to change their relationships from maybe a few kind of core asset-based uh, or third-party uh, logistic-based company to a wider net of logistics and transportation providers. So um, they're gonna have to have multiple relationships in different geographies, maybe even uh, with different modes, along with incorporating uh, LTL and consolidation. So um, again, I'll, I'll say that that is that is the core of what we do here at Robinson. We, do, we aggregate all of that demand uh, from a capacity standpoint, and we leverage that on behalf of our customers. But uh, retailers on the grocery side, they're gonna have to think about uh, how that changes their relationships, the people they work with, uh, the technology they're gonna have to incorporate, uh, all in this, because that, that freight and who they have normally dealt with in the past, it's all changing. You know, it's interesting because I think a lot of times when we talk about transportation, in grocery retail, specifically around e-commerce, it's all about the outbound side, right? It's the home delivery of grocery and, and what some of the key players are doing there, whether they're leveraging their own uh, transportation assets or they're partnering with a lot of these startups that are kind of helping out with that delivery uh, piece. But what you just talked about is, you know, you can argue is just as complex and perhaps even more because you got to have that product into the stores or that inventory available okay. to be able to fulfill on that. And yeah. that part of the supply chain is changing. So that's really what you're, you're talking about here is like, hey, you don't, don't it, the story here is beyond just the home delivery piece and what's going on there because that gets a lot of the press. I mean, a, a big part of the story is what happens before the product even gets to the store, you know, in terms of even having the inventory available to do that, right? Yep. And so micro meaning uh, you may within geographies have different suppliers um, that, that may create the same SKUs for you from a national perspective. Um, but because of the short shelf life, the fact that trans is uh, probably, they may produce at uh, say three, four, five in the morning. It could be on store shelves by 10 uh, that day. That It's just changing everything in terms of who those suppliers are uh, within a certain geography so they can meet the demands. Uh, manufacturing's moving closer uh, to core geographies. Um, warehousing and logistics has to move uh, right along with it. Right, right. Consumers want, they want that convenience. No, absolutely. absolutely. So I, I think this is a good way to kind of, you know, you, you know, wrap up now. Um, you know, in light of everything, you know, we, we kind of talked about, I mean, what action should, you know, grocery retailers and their perishable supply chain, you know, partners to, you know, what, what action should they take to succeed in, yeah. in this new yeah. environment? And what ultimately, what factors will separate the leaders from the laggards in this industry? So when, when we've, we've done a lot of uh, work, uh, obviously, over the past uh, couple years here and the changing dynamics of the marketplace and changing our service offerings to, to meet that demand out there, um, in order for them to keep up 
with the macro expansion of these micro supply chains, really there's three areas that they need to, to win in. The first is third party warehousing and partnerships with, uh, with those warehousing networks. Uh, the second one is third party logistics because uh, you're going to need a third party partner in order to leverage all of these different relationships and capacity that are unique to that micro supply chain. And then lastly, uh, you're gonna need a technology uh, platform to manage all of these different POs and underlying data to give you a good return on what's going on in your stores. So just to give you kind of a, a real world example, as we worked with a retailer out west, um, they wanted to create a store within a store for their perishables, which meant uh, meal kits, uh, all their grab and go, all their online uh, perishable orders would be the store within a store. And they attempted to build it uh, within the current DC network. And uh, what we did is we came in, we, we gave them a, whole, a full view, uh, what we could do from a micro solution standpoint around their certain geographies. Um, they saw 10% savings in their supply chain cost and they dramatically reduced shrink. So we set up a whole new uh, third party warehousing network. Uh, we went DSD with them. And we overlaid that with uh, one complete PO management system. That way all POs could be uh, tendered outbound to suppliers, inbound to stores, and managed in whether uh, the store order came from, it didn't matter what application platform that came into. And that allowed them to have this full visibility. So solutions are third-party warehousing, third-party logistics, and technology uh, really to kind of to kind of manage it all. Um, just to really, to, to put a bow tie on it for you, um, as these supply chains expand and contract, depending on the consumer demands, as micro supply chains uh, become macro in nature, um, you're gonna need really quick turn uh, suppliers, quick turn distribution centers based on a uh, geographical pattern uh, that drives uh, convenience for the for the uh, purchaser and uh, the right product at the right time uh, for the retailer. So that's kind of the micro part, setting that up. Uh, but then you're also gonna need a solution uh, to ensure that you're getting the right product, the right time at the right price and with the right date on it. And that's the macro sense. So um, to wrap it up, that, that is what we do here. That's what we do with our managed procurement uh, services. We do that on the supply side of our business and we marry that up with the uh, logistics side. So as these micro supply chains become more prevalent in nature, you're going to need a macro partner to help you solve them. So I appreciate, yeah. appreciate the time and the questions today. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, this is a topic that I think I might have mentioned this the last time you were on the program. Grocery retailers near and dear to my heart because, uh, you know, my uh, my dad and my uncles had a bodega, you know, a yep. neighborhood store in Brooklyn yep. when I was growing up. And I worked, in, that's where I worked, you know, as a, as a kid, uh, you know, growing up. And so it's, a, it's amazing to me to see the uh, the transformation that continues to take place in, you know, in, in, in this industry. And as we, we discussed today, you know, a lot of op a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities and moving forward. You know, all the stakeholders in this industry uh, are going to have to, uh, you know, the, the rules for success are changing. Uh, right. So they need to take a, a fresh perspective. And I think there's going to be, you know, it's going to require, require uh, you know, stronger, you know, collaboration and synchronization between all the parties involved, you know, to, to succeed moving forward. You know, like I always say, we always just manage to scratch the, 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 the surface yeah. on these topics. Right. But I think we got the conversation started great today. And Certainly uh, look forward to, you know, seeing how this continues to evolve in the, in the weeks and months and, and years ahead. So, Todd, again, thank you for making the time. Oh, to be with Thank us. you for having me. I, I appreciate it. So um, supply chains are adapting. Consumers are adapting. We, uh, we have to adapt along with that. We need we create solutions for that adaptation. And uh, we're actually excited about all these all these changes that are going on. It's uh, it's really good for the industry. Um, the creation of all these new perishable items, uh, the fact that consumers want to eat healthier, fresher uh, type items, and uh, we want to create solutions to get those items uh, in, into them. 
So they, so they keep buying them, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So it's, you know, again, it's this change that creates excitement that draws, you know, ultimately it's what makes this industry so vibrant and, 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 and exciting and particularly, you know, why I believe it's going to continue to draw, you know, more and more young professionals in, into the industry because there's a lot of exciting things, you know, happening here. So again, thank you for joining us. Now, if you're watching this episode on demand at the CH Robinson website or on Talking Logistics, and you've got a question or a comment for uh, Todd, you can post it there and I'm sure he'll be more than happy to respond via that medium. Again, thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great thank day. Thank you.